December 20th, 1860, South Carolina is the first state to secede from the Union. Four months later, Federal Fort Sumter is attacked by Confederate forces, Union troops surrender, and the Confederate flag is raised above the fort, starting the Civil War. Virginia secedes May 23rd, 1861. Virginia native and Union War veteran Thomas Jonathan Jackson joins the Confederate Army and assumes command of forces at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. In the spring of 1862, three large Union armies approached the Confederate capital, Richmond, Virginia. Major General Jackson began what famously became the Shenandoah Valley Campaign. This campaign is considered one of the most brilliant in U.S., if not world, military history. Vastly outnumbered and at times facing three Union armies, Jackson managed in less than three months to march his Army of the Valley hundreds of miles and fight a series of engagements and a masterpiece of military art that ultimately created a grand diversion which tied up thousands of Union troops threatening Richmond. So I'm standing at Fort Edward Johnson. Johnson set up the outpost here and built breastworks to defend this pass on the, uh, the turnpike from Staunton into the Shenandoah Valley here. At the end of April, Johnson's troops of 3,000 men were ordered to reinforce Jackson back at Staunton, which was further east. After he met up with, uh, with Jackson and Staunton, a small group of Union troops ended up occupying Fort Johnson here for a short period of time until Jackson moved back with his reinforcements from Staunton into the, uh, into the western end of the, the mountains here. They actually came back up into Fort Johnson, but just as they arrived, there was nobody here and they actually could see the Union troops flank off of the distance in the valley. Confederate troops spent much of April preparing for battle with the Union troops. So they ended up building their breastworks to defend this critical passage uh, through from Staunton to the Shenandoah Valley on this side. Uh, but they were actually called to leave here and meet up with, uh, with Jackson and Staunton to reinforce his troops. So once they combined with Jackson's force and Staunton, they ended up marching back west down this route, retook this fort from the small group of Union troops that were here, and then they stayed overnight. The next day they marched straight west into McDowell to that epic battle with Union troops. So the red brick house is the headquarters for Jackson's campaign for the Shenandoah Valley here in McDowell. Union troops took it for a while, but after the defeat of Union troops by Jackson's uh, unit in um, Battle of McDowell, he regained the, his headquarters. The locals say that this is actually owned by a Nebraska family who uh, no longer really deals with it much but somebody's cutting the grass here but it's all posted and supposedly it's falling down unfortunately so during the battle in McDowell this church was actually used as a uh, as a hospital for both Union and Confederate soldiers um, you can see down here the Union troops were lined up against this creek down here on top of the hill was where the battle was waging the troops Union troops would forced their way up that hill against the 12th Georgia who is in the front of that, that charge. To the rear of the church, the Union troops had artillery set up and were nailing that position where the Confederates sat on top of Sittlington's hill.
actually a plaque out here. So it says uh, May 8th, 1862, one mile southeast, Jackson and Edward Johnson defeated Milroy and Schenck. This church served both blue and gray as a hospital. So this thing was erected in 1926. After talking to a local in the area, they tipped me off to um, actually writing and grading to the side of this church that was dated back to 1862. So I want to see if we can actually find it. So they said that the uh, the bushes might have grown up against it, but there was actually writing carved into the uh, the stone the stonework somewhere out here um, by the soldiers in 1862. Yeah, and actually now that I so right there 1862, 1903. Yeah, it looks like there's actually more writing going down inside the uh, behind the bushes there, but that's pretty cool. This. To me, this brick doesn't look that old, but I don't know. There's definitely a lot of carving into the side of the red brick. Yeah, beautiful area of Virginia. You see there's all kinds of carving here. Here we have an 1890. Another 1862. Yes, I don't know how authentic that is. Now across the street here, this is where uh, the cemetery across from the church. This is where uh, some of the Confederate and Union soldiers were buried during the Battle of McDowell. These would have been the soldiers that, that passed away while in the, uh, the hospital here across the street. So there was an estimated of a total 500, around 500 people that died during this, this uh, couple hours battle. It was really only like half of the day. The, uh, the afternoon and the evening of May 8th, 1862. And they actually did put a plaque here in this area, buried Confederate and Union soldiers who died at McDowell, Virginia, May 8th, 1862. So strange I don't see any, uh, any of the government markings or Civil War markings showing uh, where they are buried. So I'm wondering if they are actually unmarked graves. All right, the Battle of McDowell, AKA the Battle of Sitlington's Hill. This is where Confederate troops under Stonewall Jackson held off a large Union force. So this actually has a lot of markers along the way. This sign says, if you had been standing here at 5.30 p.m. on May 8th, 1862, the Battle of McDowell, McDowell would have been in full swing in front of you. You would have been second in line of Confederate infantry moving up Sitlington's Hill to reinforce your battered comrades. Looking around, you would have seen wounded men stumbling back this way, officers dashing to and fro in a thick cloud of smoke blowing from the crest of the hill. Colonel Nathaniel McLean said, the fire of the enemy was heavy, coming sometimes in tremendous volleys as if they meant by one fire to sweep us from the mountain. Colonel William C. Scott, from the 44th Virginia Infantry said, do you intend to let the damned Yankees drive you from your own soil? Question mark. It is so nice up here. It's hard to imagine the death and destruction that occurred on this event. There was a point that the Confederate soldiers were actually using dead bodies as breastworks, stacking them up to guard themselves from the volley of fire from the Union troops below. Standing out here now, it's just so peaceful. 
other than the mosquitoes. So we're reaching closer to the top of the hill here. For me, I like the individual tactics used in these battles, but for me, this isn't about the individual tactics. It's about what some has called Stonewall Jackson's military art that he used in the Shenandoah Valley campaign. The fact that Jackson started out with such a small amount of troops and uh, his, his use of deceit uh, bordering guerrilla warfare where he actually tricked the Federals uh, into thinking he was going east into uh, Richmond, Virginia. And then he turns around, puts his troops on a train, shoots them back over to Staunton, reinforces his troops at that point with Johnson's troops, and then marches back into McDowell here. He picked a key location overlooking the, uh, the turnpike, the Staunton Turnpike down below. These two mounds overlook the entire valley. It was a cutoff point for the approaching uh, Union troops from the uh, west heading towards Richmond. So this would have been the front lines of Siplington's Hill. This is the top of it here. So Jackson came up to the top to, uh, to look for positions to flank the Union Army. He couldn't find any such way to do that. So the Unions actually attacked from the front. They had the 12th Georgia at the front of the lines. They took the heaviest casualties. So out of the approximately 532 casualties of the Confederate Army versus the 230-something Union casualties, 180 of those were estimated to be from the 12th Georgia unit in the front lines here. They took the brunt of the Union charge up this hill. So some would argue that this was a draw since the Union forces withdrew and retreated, but the Confederates lost almost twice as many casualties. But this was, I'd say, a tactical defeat for for Jackson, but he achieved his strategic objective, which was to hold off Union troops from consolidating and hitting Richmond. I mean, when I think about this, this whole Shenandoah Valley campaign that Jackson waged, really, if, they, if the Union forces, there was three different Union forces approaching Richmond at this time. In 1862, that would have been the end of the Civil War, most likely after one year of fighting speculate that at least but if they would have took the capital the confederate capital um, in 1862 richmond virginia that would have i'm thinking the end of the civil war but because of jackson's shenandoah valley campaign this war went on for three more years the, the things that i found interesting about this battle was the fact that it tied a lot of things to uh you know the pennsylvania living in pennsylvania york area gettysburg obviously you know, a huge battle and a turning point in the war, but there were small skirmishes. So just prior to this battle, uh, General Ewell linked up with Jackson to fortify his troops, which actually brought Jackson's troops from around 3,500 up to about 17,000, thanks to Ewell and Johnson's troops. So Ewell ended up taking Jackson's place after, the, uh, after Jackson was injured in the ba uh, Battle of Chancellorville. And mortally wounded and died uh, not too long after that that wound but Ewell ended up taking charge of the role that Jackson had so Ewell was controversial in uh, Gettysburg obviously for not taking Cemetery Hill on that initial engagement but Ewell was the first uh, to actually penetrate into Pennsylvania he uh, he ended up uh, a couple small skirmishes and there's still breastworks above right around Fort Washington area in Lemoyne Pennsylvania above uh, Harrisburg before uh, General Lee called him back to Gettysburg, and that's where he engaged Union troops. Uh, but he refused, he refused uh, orders by General Lee to actually take Cemetery Hill. And some speculate that if he would have taken Cemetery Hill right there at the beginning of that battle, took that high ground, that that would have, uh, that would have, that basically um, cost them the war by not taking that hill right off the bat. Jackson continued victories up till June 8th and 9th, where he won two decisive battles against Banks' army and effectively returned control of the Shenandoah Valley to the Confederacy. <laughs>